Welcome to the SEI podcast series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense and operated by Carnegie Mellon University. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcast. My name is Suzanne Miller. I'm a principal researcher here at the SEI, and today I am very pleased to introduce you to David Svoboda, a researcher on the CERT Secure Coding Team. In this podcast, we will discuss his recent analysis of the Java and C coding languages to see which one is more secure. First, a little bit about our guest. David is a software security engineer at CERT SEI. He co-authored and contributed to four books, including the CERT C coding standard and the CERT Oracle Secure Coding Standard for Java. David has over 15 years of Java development experience, starting with Java 2. And his Java projects include Tomcat servlets and Eclipse plugins. He also maintains the C SEI CERT coding standard wikis, and he has taught secure coding in C, C++, and Java all over the world to various groups in the military, government, and banking industries. David is also involved in several ISO standards groups, including one for standardizing C and one for standardizing C++. He has been the primary developer on a diverse set of software development projects at Carnegie Mellon University since 1991. His projects have ranged from hierarchical chip modeling and social organization simulation to automated machine translation, known as AMT. His Cantu automated machine translation software, developed in 1996, is still in production use at Caterpillar Industries. Welcome, David. You're a busy guy. Hello, Suzanne. <laughs> so you did this analysis on the security of the coding rules for C, for C language and Java language, and you posted that in a blog. And you've had over 50 comments from Hacker News, which may not be, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a, a little bit different kind of uh, resource than the SEI Insights blog, but that's pretty spectacular to get that kind of conversation going. So why don't you tell us a little bit about why you decided this analysis was needed and why you think this has generated so much discussion within uh, that part of the community? Well, uh, the analysis actually started because of an argument I had with my boss. Uh, a little bit of history, we developed the first version of the C coding standard in 2008. Mm -hmm. And then we started to work on the Java standard, and that was first published in 2011. And the Java standard was actually uh, proposed to us by a student who said, you know, your C standard is cool, let's build one for Java. And we thought, Fair enough. we thought, sure, this will be easy. Java is a secure language, you're not going to find any rules. And the student proceeded to do what students always do best, which is show us just how spectacularly wrong we were. Okay. So from there, from there, we wound up with about 100 rules in C and 170 rules in Java. And well, we, and so my boss basically suggested, gee, Java has so many more rules than C. I thought it was a more secure language, you know, implying that the number of rules was, you know, was directly correlated. Yeah, with the actual security of a language. Yeah. Now, of course, neither he nor I think that's academically rigorous, uh, the number of rules. But you know, it's still strongly intuitive. It's a, still it's a pretty important metric because it it indicates you know how much you have to learn in order to program securely. Right. You've got to learn more rules in Java than you do in C if you want to to uh, create secure code. Well, that was the that was the argument. Okay. And so my the point of this analysis was to try and refute that argument that Java is not a less secure language just because it has more rules. I see. Okay. That's why we did the. The, the analysis. And is that what you found when you actually completed the analysis? And that is exactly what we found when we when I completed the analysis. So first of all, as I've said, uh, if you look at this first uh, bar graph, uh, you can see that Java has more rules overall than C. Mm -hmm. So I decided to try focusing on the most severe rules. Uh, all of our rules okay. have a uh, severity metric, and the highest fig value in the security metric indicates a rule where if you violate it, someone can take over your computer. Okay. So the higher the severity metric, the more the right. the more important that security rule is to follow. Exactly. The more critical it is to follow, the more you're going to lose if you right. if you if, if you someone attacks it. you there. Yes. The lower security rules, you know, they can only just make an attacker crash your program. 
but not minor necessarily details. act. Yeah, minor details. It's easy to restart such a program. But anyway, the point is that uh, the red in the graph here shows the number of high severity rules in both C and Java. And as you can see, they're very close. Mm -hmm. And so actually C is a little bit higher, according to C this. Is a C is indeed higher. Um, but it's only, it's, I believe, 32 versus 29 rules. Yeah, so it's so, not a huge number in terms of... of exactly. Not, not when you translate that into practice, it's not going to make a huge difference. So, so at that point, I was saying, you know, what gives? We thought Java was a more secure language. Why are there just as many high severity rules for it that, than there are for C? You know, there are plenty of, of um, types of vulnerabilities in C that you don't have to worry about in Java, such so, as memory corruption. Buffer overflows are a problem almost exclusive to C. A mm -hmm. uh, couple languages like C++ have it too. But Java was designed to prevent buffer overflows and right. memory corruption. And so all of those all of those C rules should have gone away and not appeared in Java. And right. you know, we don't see that at all in this bar graph. Right. It's, yeah, that's not visible. So what's up with that? So what's up with that? Um, that's the, that was the main focus of this analysis. The next thing I did was I simply took the high severity rules and I said, you know, why is this rule high severity? We categorized them and they fell into four categories that you can see in the two pie charts. Um, in the two pie charts here, uh, I wound up with four categories for C and four categories for Java. So as you can see in C, the biggest category is memory corruption, mm -hmm. and the biggest Java category is uh, internal privilege escalation. So again, the intuition should hold. Memory corruption is the biggest part of C, and there's no memory right. corruption in Java. Right. So what's going on? So um, a large part of the blog is spent uh, addressing what these categories are, what is memory corruption, mm -hmm. uh, privilege escalation, and so on. But the uh, so the main point to note was uh, actually the privilege escalation. Both C and Java have rules okay. about privilege escalation, but privilege escalation is a different um, it's a different problem in both C and Java. Okay. So first of all, privilege escalation itself just simply means that uh, for you have a privilege system, such as a lock on your door, right. and that a privilege escalation vulnerability is if someone's able to get past your door, even though you know, even they, the lock. Even though they don't have a key. Out. Yeah. I mean, I have a key to my office door, but that key doesn't let me into your office right. or the, most of the other rooms in the SCI. And to have a privilege escalation vulnerability, you have to have a system of privileges. If we took all the locks off here, then my skeleton key wouldn't, wouldn't get me anywhere right, right. forbidden. But taking all the locks off will have other problems you don't <laughs> need to worry about. Other security issues. Uh, right. Right. So. The difference between C and Java is that Java has its own privilege system that it uses to uh, chaperone things like applets. Okay. That's how the, you are able to run a uh, Java applet on your computer that you know, what doesn't have code that you necessarily know or trust. Right. Um, at the SCI here, we've used Java applets to do refresher courses on, you know, on new policies, you know, recognizing terrorists, sexual harassment, that kind of thing. Right. Refresher courses that everyone here is supposed to take. And those have been using Java applets even as recently as last year. And so those Java applets are kept secure by Java's, Java's internal privilege system. Okay. Now C has no internal privilege system. There's nothing to find the language. So if you write a C program and I run it, that program can do anything. Uh, there's no chaperone. As yeah, there's word. no chaperone. Right. Exactly. Now, there are external privilege systems that most operating systems provide. You know, if you've ever if you've ever tried to run a program or do something and your computer pops up and says, uh, "I need an administration password to right. do that," that is uh, the we see that admin a lot system. at the SCI. Uh, yes. yes, we do. Sometimes I even know the password to use, and most of the time I don't. But uh, yeah, Windows and Linux, other computers will have these privilege systems, but they are not part of a programming language. Right. Um, so so as C, a programmer, I not only have to know my programming language rules, but I, if I don't have rules that cover situations like privilege, I need to also know how to use the rules that are provided by the operating system. Right. So that adds a little bit of a layer of complexity 
in terms of, of how I use that language. Right. So the rules with regard to an external privilege system apply to both C and Java. Okay. But in C, they're, they're just this small wedge. And um, well, we haven't put them into Java uh, simply because uh, these rules were part of the section of the chapter that dealt specifically with uh, POSIX. Okay. And there's a handful of rules as well for Windows. But in Java, the rules, the big rules that we have here in the big wedge, the big blue wedge, deal with Java's internal privilege gotcha. system. Okay. So, again, what you have is both languages have rules about privilege systems. And what happens is if you take those privilege systems away, then you wind up with the second uh, bar chart where you still have a bunch of, high mm. of uh, rules, but suddenly there's many less high severity rules in Java than there are in C. Mm. And that means that if you are not running a program that works, that uh, interacts with a privilege system, you don't have to worry about that category of rules. Right. So you have fewer rules to worry about. You have fewer, well, you have fewer high severity rules to worry about. Oh, yes. Exactly. Yes, high severity rules. So, the upshot is if you're not working with Java's internal privilege system, and by that I mean you're running a Java desktop app or a mobile app mm -hmm. or even an applet, um, then you don't have to worry about most of about all of those privilege rules and the amount of high severity rules you have to have is this little red sliver as opposed to that big red stripe that you have if you're in if you're working in C. So when you were conducting this analysis, are there things that surprised you that you, you expected to find, but uh, you know, were not the way you, you had uh, Well, like I said, in the, the first bar graph, we see that the number of high severity rules in C and Java were about equivalent. So that was, that was a surprise. That was the surprise. Okay. It was uh, counterintuitive. I expected there to be a lot less in Java because again, we don't have that whole memory corruption This is section. why we do these analyses, so that we can check on so our the intuition analysis, and exactly. understand what the real data is. The analysis was trying to give some scientific rigor to, to our intuition. Okay. And so, how can developers use this system? How, what kinds of things are you seeing on, on uh, the different uh, sites that are discussing this? Uh, you know, what do they see as the major takeaways from So the major takeaway, again, is, is in this third bar chart, is that is if you're not writing a, if, you're not, if your program does not require escalated privileges, if you're not working with unprivileged code, then you, have, then you have less high severity Java rules to worry about than C rules. Which theoretically should make it easier to write secure software exactly. in Java. Exactly. It should be much easier to write software that okay. doesn't get pwned. And uh, that's, so that's, that matches our intuition that Java was a more a secure language okay. than C. Right. Fair enough. So you have other things besides these kinds of uh, uh, analyses that you're doing. What are some other projects that are coming up from the secure coding team that Many people have to things. look forward to? Many other things. Right now I'm, I'm doing four projects. Uh, half of my time is spent working on a project called the Source Code Analysis Lab. And in this project we, um, well, it's a very simple business model. You give us some code, and we will tell you if this code violates any of our secure coding rules and exactly ah, okay. where. And that includes the C rules and the Java rules, depending on your code's language. Sure. Um, and we'll basically give you a report saying we found the following problems. Okay. And if we don't find any problems, then we will um, we'll declare your code as compliant with our standard and give you a nice little certificate and put you in a registry. And uh, Okay. Hopefully, our hopefully our certificate, you know, will you can use that as as marketing to say, you know, our software is secure. It passed right. the Cert C right. scale standard. And as we get into more Internet of Things and more kinds of not as common areas that we think about software being an impact, these kinds of cer certifications are one of the ways that people can gain trust that. Even though you know, I don't expect people who build light bulbs to understand coding. They at least are applying secure coding practices right. and things like that. For the big problem with security is if you have to choose between two software projects for your for your next purchase, are you going to choose the one that's more secure, or the one that's less secure? To answer that question, you have to be a security expert. Most people right. are not, and most people will go with the one that's cheaper or the one that has more features. Being more secure is not. It's not, not in the public soluble public point. eye. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's not a soluble point. So if if the more secure product can can give a certification, 
can say, hey, here's a cert stamp of seal of approval, right. then that becomes okay. a marketing uh, feature. So that's only one of four projects you're on. That's only one of four projects. Uh, the second project is a, um, um, it's a lens project to try and uh, help improve scale and secure co and uh, uh, software analysis by guessing which um, which reports diagnostics from a tool are likely to be true and which ones are likely to be false positives. So uh -huh. the problem with uh, with most analysis tools that look for vulnerabilities and bugs is that they tend to report problems that are not really there. I see. We call those false positives, and we hope to be able to take a look at a code base and a set of these reports and say which ones are false and which ones are true, which would help, which would help an auditor, you know, it would not be as good as an auditor. An auditor a human being would still need to look sure. at it, but they can, they can Helps prioritize. Them hone in on, they on can the focus things. on the things yeah. the machine thinks is true and which ones the machine thinks is false, they can, they can discard those. Right. Excellent. So that's another project, and that's also taking half of my time. Uh, a third project <laughs> I'm working on is to help Your classic finish. software engineer, Dave. Yes. <laughs> the third project is to help finish the CERT Secure Coding Standard for C++. Okay, that We've makes had sense. a C++ standard in the works for several years now, and it is our goal to finish it, and that's taking up half of my time. All right. And the last We're project... Up to three halves. Yeah, and ahead. the last project is automated code repair. And that simply uh, takes the notion that, well, so we have a program and we know that it has a vulnerability on line 46. Is there some way we can automatically fix this without have forcing a developer to go through and manually do it? You know, oh, or suppose it has 100 vulnerabilities on line 46, 52, 59. Right. You know, asking a, asking a developer to fix one vulnerability is pretty simple. Asking them to fix 100 is going to take a long Especially time. Especially with all the interrelationships that are likely. Exactly. So if we, if we can write a tool that would do this automatically or would do this saying, would you like to fix you know, these five things, just right. you know, press this button, um, then you know, that would improve that would that would raise the state of coding and and you know I think that's reduce that developer one's going to take more than half your time. Well, it's currently <laughs> slated at uh, I think thirty percent of my so. time, but uh, that puts me at what one hundred eighty. Oh, let's not go there. Yeah. You're, like I said, you're like every software engineer I know. You 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 take on more and researcher. You take on all the interesting things, but it takes time to do all of them. Uh, yes, usually time that I would be I could be better sleeping. So. <laughs> David, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the kind of work that the SEI is known for doing, for providing this kind of analysis and validating or contradicting our intuition so, with real data. So that's, that's a great service. If you'd like to find out more uh, about David's work in this area, uh, insights, insigts -I -E edu is where you'll find the blog that got all this discussion started. And so, um, if you want to see, uh, listen to the podcast, it will be on sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts, along with the transcript. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching.